speaker, uh, Janos Kolár. Janos grew up in Hungary and studied first in Budapest and briefly also with Manin and Liskovsky in, in Moscow. He then applied to study for a doctorate in Moscow but failed his politics examination. <laughs> so he was prevented from studying where he wanted to study. And as usual in these matters, the Eastern Bloc's loss was the United States gain. So Janos went to Brandeis, got his PhD in 1984 under the supervision of um, Matsusaka, and then went to Harvard and eventually settled in Utah where he built a powerhouse of higher dimensional bi-rational geometry with many students, postdocs, friends, rivals, some of whom are here today. Um, he moved to Princeton in 1999 where he's, he's now a donor professor of science. So Janusz worked widely within and around algebraic geometry, initially in higher dimensional algebraic geometry and the minimal model program, he's very influential papers and books um, with Mori in particular and, and many others. Then he worked on rational connectedness, uh, rationality questions, introducing characteristic P ideas into rationality questions. And his, his work has also touched on singularity theory, low dimensional topology, and, and several other fields. He's been an ICM speaker twice and received other numerous awards and honors, some of which are listed. Um, but I think all I'd say now is a big welcome to Janusz. His title is Celestial Surfaces. That's okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I think that you will see a certain progression in the in the topics of the talks during this day. day. The first talk it covered, covered all of mathematics and physics. Uh, then the second talk, it covered an important area in differential geometry. Whereas, I just want to tell you that I, that I found a nice seashell and I found it interesting and I, I just want to show it to you. Okay? So, uh, so, so it will be easier. Yes, and so, so there will be a few pictures which, as you will see, are completely beyond my ability to make. So, so these are the, are the people people who contributed it. And so the first question you might have during, about the talk, what is a celestial surface? Well, as a first approximation, you can think about it as a cyclic. Now, some of you might not know what a cyclic is, but luckily here, you can consult the local authority, which is Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> and in the 1896 edition, when you look up cyclic, then it says it's the envelope of a sphere whose center moves on a fixed quadric and which cuts a fixed sphere orthogonally. And so, well, uh, you know, I think our standards really came down. So this was written <laughs> for, for sort of, you know, the general, well-educated English public. And, 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 you know, I still cannot cannot completely decode this definition. <laughs> it seemed to have been very helpful to people. And it's, so the new edition uh, it, it reproduces this and, as, and just mentioned that it hasn't been updated since 1896, <laughs> which I understand. OK, now, then if you come from the German tradition, and you, <laughs> then you see that Felix Klein Great Encyclopedia, it devotes 60, 60 pages to the topic of cyclists. Now the whole encyclopedia is about 6,000 pages, so, so maybe 60 out of it is relatively small, but still, it's a substantial amount. Okay, and so let's see. Okay, so then let's go now to my definition of, of, of about the celestial surfaces. Well, it's just a surface, in some higher dimensional space, I mean, classically, classically a surface in, in three space, space that contains at least three circles through, sorry, at least two circles through a general point, okay? And so then the question is, well, can we understand all of these surfaces or, or describe them and what's happening with them? Okay, now then, so, you know, this sounds very differential, so geometric, so, and, and so why would an algebraic geometer be interested in it? Because it's, it, 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 it seems fairly easy to prove 
that the surface that contains at least two algebraic curves uh, through a general, general point is in fact locally algebraic. And so you know, it can be, be so for, for instance, the surface of a polyhedron is like that. I mean, it's locally just a, just a plane. So it's made up out of algebraic like pieces is essentially we can just sort of glue various algebraic surfaces together along their intersection lines. And so that means that the really interesting case is when we look at algebraic surfaces where there are at least two circles through a general point. Okay, and, and so I, I so keep saying general point because of course sometimes the circles they might generate into pairs of lines or double lines. So so I, I, I sort of don't want to, to say this all the time. Okay, now the, the f first person who I actually looked at maybe some example was Dupin, and then more seriously Kumar was thinking about it, but I, so I think it was Darbu who sort of more systematically tried to understand then these surfaces, and, and he worked out out lots and lots of examples, and the, 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 a lot of it is treated in the in the book by Coolidge, a treatise on the circle and the sphere, which was actually published by Oxford University the Press. And, and, and Coolidge uh, at the time was chairman of the man of the math department at Harvard. So, 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 so it's no, it seems it was a really interesting to that topic about 100 years ago. People really were, were thinking about it. Now, if you step back a little bit, then you can ask a simpler question. What are the surfaces when there are at least two lines through every point or every general point? And, and so this is well known. These are, are just the planes or the one-sheeted hyperboloid. Yeah? So these are the examples, and so the, 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 there are some real life examples here. So it seems that the people who people who started to look at cyclic recently, they worked at at, at, at some architecture schools. So so their main interest was in getting some some nice architectural forms out of this, and so so some of the pictures. So they will be buildings that, 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 that utilize cyclids or at least the, the same principle. And so I believe this is the control tower at the Kobe airport. And then if I'm right, then this is in Sydney, maybe, maybe a TV tower. It's again, you, you can see the two sets of lines. Okay, now then let's look at the examples of of celestial surfaces. So now we are moving more complicated. But the planes, of course, there are lots of circles through any point, and also the spheres. Again, there are lots of circles. Now, but are there some more? Well, and the claim is that, uh, that in fact quadrics are like that. Now, of course, you have to, to think about this a little bit. I mean, is this true? And so, for instance, the simplest quadric is just the round cylinder. And I mean, you see the, see sort of one set of circles in it. You might know, just sort of slice it like this perpendicularly. So where are the other circles? Well, uh, maybe this is a degenerate example. But you know that if you have a cylinder, a salami, you know, if you slice it sideways, you get nice ellipses. Now you can, can think about it or so try it next time if you have a salami, uh, but you start with an elliptic salami. Yeah? <laughs> so the normal cross sections are, are ellipses. And so you can get this by buying an ordinary salami and sitting at it. <laughs> <laughs> sitting on it. And now then the claim is that there are exactly two ways of slicing an elliptic salami that the slices will be circled. Okay? So if there is a rotational symmetry that some of these two families please collide, but as soon as you have a quadric that does not have rotational symmetry, then there are two families of circles in it. Well, if you want some numerical examples, then, then they, are, they are here, and you see, so that's the problem that if A equals B, 
which exactly corresponds to a rotational symmetry, then the plus or minus doesn't do anything. So that means that the two families of circles uh, coincide. Now, le le let's see what's the theoretical reason of this. Why do you, you expect a quadric to have, to have two families of circles? Okay? Now, so if I have Rn with coordinates x1 through xn, I can embed it into to projective n space. And then there's the ideal quadric at, in, at infinity, uh, you know, sum of the xi square equals 0. So that sits at infinity. And now, it's, 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 it's rather easy computation that a conic is a circle if and only if it meets the ideal quadric at two points. So the ideal quadric has co-dimension two, so that means the general conic does not meet it, but you can, can you know, but, but sometimes it, it meets it at two points. Now, now let's look at the quadric in P3. Well, it's a degree two surface, and then there's the conic at infinity, the ideal conic, and you expect a degree two surface meets a conic all together at four points. Now, the idea of conic, it has no real points. That means you get two conjugate point pairs at infinity. Now, if you look at it you know, as one conjugate point pair, and you look at the family of real, uh, real planes that pass through them, then they intersect the quadric surface well, in degree two curves, they are conics, and you know there are those two intersection points with the ideal quadric at infinity, and so that means that there are there are two directions such that the parallel uh, plane sections with this they are just circles. Okay, so here there is some some nice set of example. Okay, so I just just said this. This is the the way they come. Okay. Now here there's another well-known example of a, of, of a surface with, with, with two sets of circles in it, and that's the torus. Yeah? You just start with a circle in the plane and you rotate it around, well then, then there's a circle that moves and then any point, point here sweeps out a circle. So there are, and here are the circles on the torus. Okay, now this is sort of a side uh, the, the direction, maybe more interested to algebraic geometry. As well, I told you that these are algebraic surfaces, yeah? That, that we are looking at algebraic surfaces. And so the torus is some algebraic surface. Actually, yesterday I gave it as a, it as a homework to the algebraic geometry section to tell me what kind of surface is it in our standard language of algebraic geometry. And so again, my guess is this is a, a this is a question that hundred years ago, every algebraic geometer would have known the answer right away. And now, I actually, as it earlier at the algebra geometric conference, there were 150 people in the room, and actually nobody knew what kind of algebraic surface the 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 torus is. So it's just interesting. I will tell you a little bit. Uh, bit later. Uh, okay, now maybe the next question is, which so actually might not occur to you, uh, well, are there more circles on the torus? So we found already, already two families. Are there more? Now this is, again, a very classical topic, but first here there's a soothing picture of the torus if the previous one was, was sort of too, 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 too colorful. You can can think about it, are there more circles there? And it turns out that there are. They are called the Villarceau circle, after Captain Antoine Joseph Francois Yvon Villarceau, uh, who found them in 1848. And you see here they are. Yeah? So that there are that there are two more sets of circles on the torus. Um, Oh, 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 on the other hand, it turns out to be it's not as new because in the Strasbourg Cathedral, something from around 1300, so let's see, this is the laser pointer. So it is not those on the top, but, but actually these lines, yeah? 
So th these are here's the, here's the Torahs, and there are three of the Vilarso circles, I believe, illustrated. So, so they probably should not be called Vilarso circles, but but we don't know who made these. And so, yeah. Um, okay. And so, now of course, once you have sort of here, you have four families of circles on the, the Torahs, you might ask, well, are there some more? Yeah. And now, now it turns out that on the Torahs there are exactly these four families of circles, no more. But you again might become suspicious the same way as when you had quadrics with rotational uh, uh, symmetry, they had fewer circles than you, you would have expected. You would expect two families on a quadric, but, but the rotational uh, uh, symmetry, it, it, symmetry it killed, uh, so, or, or sort of two united. So maybe uh, there should be more if you so, you know, just bump your, your t t torus a little bit, and if you work a little bit on bumping the torus, then you start getting, getting pictures like this, where there are six circles through every point. So here is one, one picture, if you like a more psychedelic version, <laughs> it is in here. Again, you get, you get your six families of circles on on these surfaces, and it's really, they pass through every point. And you, you see there that here, the, that here for, instance, the, for instance, the two yellow families, they are, are in fact homotopic, and so when it becomes a, a totoras, then the two yellows become just, just one, and the same with the orange. And uh, families, it becomes the, the torus and these two Families here, families here to just unite, but the, but sort of the others, uh, they stay different. Okay, so now let's try to now think about it, do some algebraic e, 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 e geometry, and at least let's try to see if if we can get some with algebraic surfaces with six families of conics on them, and so and then later we will worry whether we can make the conics into actual circles. Uh, so, so I, so, yeah, okay. So we, we start with a quadric surface, which will be just for us, the real picture of it will be uh, the one-sheeted hyperboloid. And I pick just four general well, points of them. There will be a little algebraic geometry here and then I come back to some other thing. And so if sort of these don't mean too much to you, then just sleep for two minutes and then, then just wake up. So the, the, then we just blow up uh, four points. And now, it, the, the, then it turns out that there are then, then 16 smooth rational curves of that, so isomorphic to the the Riemann sphere whose self-intersection is, is, is a minus one. So it is really sort of best to look here at the complex picture, yeah, where this quadric is a four manifold, and if I, and so then I have an S2 in it, and the, the normal bundle, bundle has a complex structure, so you, you ex so it has a chain class, chain class, I would like it to have, have minus one. And now this, this 16 are, well, are there four that I get from just blowing up points. Yeah? So I, I have the four exceptional curves that gives me, me four minus one curves. Now then, so each of these PIs, there are two lines passing. Now these lines have the normal bundle is just tri trivial. If I blow up the point, it drops the normal bundle degree by one. So that means I get eight. And now what's harder to see, the, 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 that if I have a conic that passes through three of these points, then again, after blowing up, you get something uh, that, has, that has normal bundle minus one. So there are these 16 minus one curves. 
and you can assemble actually 10 families of conics out of this, okay? So, well, so where are these? So, there are the two families of lines uh, that, that exist on the hyperboloid. Now, then, if you have conics that pass through two of the points, that also becomes a family of, of conics. And now, but the hard that to see that if there are some degree three rational curves in three space that pass through all of the points, they in fact give me uh, that they give us two more more families. Okay, and so that's nice. Now it would seem to you that then you can get actually maybe ten families of circles. So uh, why don't we get ten over the reals? Well, we would like to get something like a compact surface. And so that means a compact surface, it should not have actual lines. It should. So that means that the 16 thin lines, they should exist over the complex number. So they should come in just conjugate pairs. Okay? And so, so what happens? I start with just the one sheeted hyperboloid, RP1 plus RP1. And now, so here comes the comes a problem that cuts down the number that, uh, that, that instead of oh, blowing up here four real points, I have to blow up two conjugate pairs of complex points. So that, that means that the six families, uh, families of real conics will be, but the two families of lines, uh, they give me them. But then to be real, the conics that pass through two of the blown up points, they have to pass through, through a conjugate pair of points. So they can pass through P1 and P1 bar, or PC and PC bar, but not some other their, their combination. And so here I lose four. And then, then the two families of, of to, to be listed cubics, uh, uh, the, they are there, they are nice. Andrea. So this gives me the six families of, of conics. Now the question is, well, will there be actually conics or circles? And well, it depends exactly how I, I embed this surface into three space. So I have to think about this a little bit. Uh, okay, so maybe now I should that tell you uh, what the torus is as an algebraic surface. Okay, so actually, uh, at least the normalization, the technical name is, it's a degree four del pezzo surface with four double points. So I hope that all algebraic geometers, ge geometers figure this out. Well, so how can you, you parameterize the torus? Well, I mean, just, just follow, it, follow its construction. So you start with two circles, and so, you know, I said that you start with, with one circle, that will be the circle of radius, radius A, that's the first circle, and then and the second circle, that represents the, the rotation. And then how do I map this into, into to three space? Uh, it, yeah, and so then you see that this circle is centered at the origin, so I just translate it by B. So now it's a circle of radius A centered at the, at the point B comma zero, and then I put U and V here that represent the, the rotation, and then the last coordinate, well, this Y coordinate has become Z. Okay, and so if I do it, it projectively, that's like this. And now you can see that sort of these four degree two polynomials, they all vanish at these four points. So these are then the four points that I need to, to blow up, okay? So then the, the, these are the points that I blow up. So where do I get the singularities? That the, 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 these four points, let's see. Can I, yeah, and so. So here I have P1 cross, cross P1, and uh, I blew up the four points. They sit in a very symmetric, symmetric configuration. And then, so these lines, in fact, are mapped to, 
to just points. Each of them is mapped to a point. That's how I get the four singular points. And now, as you see that the 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 the, so, so the natural way to 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 do that, in fact, there is one more degree two polynomial that vanishes at these four points, and this is W x. And if I add W x here as as last, uh, the, the, and then I map in into map in the four dimension uh, now pro pro projective space. So that that's where this thing naturally lives. And if you are in four dimensional uh, projective space, then you see in fact so both rotation as, as symmetry. If you just realize it as a, a torus, you lost one of the rotational symmetries. But in four space, you see both of the symmetries, and then you are just projecting it into, in, into to three space. And now, then you follow this construction, then, 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 then see here I use the very special configuration of, of four points, the intersection of this line. Plus, if you move these, these four points into general uh, position, uh, then you get those examples uh, the, the, the six families of circles. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Okay, now there are some more examples of surfaces with two families of circles on them, such as that you see that they are in fact in large numbers. Uh, large number, okay. Now, then there are some real life examples that, uh, that my, my architecture, architecture colleagues told me about. So, so all, all, all of these examples are, at, are sort, of, sort of a little bit with cheating, so we, 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 because these various lines are not exactly circles, but sort of they try to follow sort of the same pattern. I believe this is in Glasgow, this is the Viceroy Hotel in <coughs> Abu Dhabi, you see those lines very nicely, National Theater in Beijing, and I believe this is the, this is the King's Cross station, I hope to I hope to see it on, I think, uh, I think Saturday. So here there are maybe three sets of m m more or less conic looking in curve. I don't think they're actual, actual hyperbolas, these lines, but sort of more or less they look, look conics. Okay, now here there are some computer generated images again. And well, if you are into American, can, and politics, you I appreciate that I have both red and blue pictures <laughs> yes. to, 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 to appear neutral. Okay. And so, yes. So uh, then, uh, as I told you, the classification of the surfaces was uh, started by Depend and, and taken up seriously by Kumar and Darbu. And more recently, about 20 years ago, some more examples that were not known to Darbu, Darbu were found by Potman and, and Zubé. And uh, then, uh, he, then in this series of, of papers, they derived the completeness of the lists of, of these surfaces in R3 and, and R4. So, and I think so. Now we have them in all dimensions. Actually, it's not not uh, that much harder. And, and I mean, the most interesting is probably probably RC. Okay. So now, now again. So let's start to go back to some algebraic a, a geometry. So then you 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 ask in general that if you have an algebraic surface with at least two conics through a general point, then, then what are they? So it, it t t t turns out that this was essentially contained in some unpublished uh, notes of Kachi from, from 1999, but the, but the person who actually wrote down this list was uh, Shiho in, in, in 2001. And so, uh, so 
if you still don't know what these are, they are not particularly, particularly interesting. There are two, two cases I would like to focus on, and they are below. Uh, the, 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 the Veron is a surface, and so you, you start with, with P2, and then you look on a degree to, to, to polynomials in sort of three variables, if you treat them as, as, uh, as homogeneous, there are six of them, so they map P2 into to, to, to P5, that's the Veronese surface, and then there's a double Zegre embedding of, of P1 cross P1, so again, again uh, P1 cross P1, and you look at sort of the normal Zegre in embedding, you look at polynomials that, that are homogeneous of degree one in both sets of variables, but here we are interested in, in, in polynomials that are homogeneous of degree two in both sets of, 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 of variables. So that embeds that's P1 cross P1 into to, to, to P8. And now you see then where will be, be the, the conics if I have any line in P2, then since I map it by degree two polynomial, then the image of any line will be just a conic. So that means that this will be an interesting surface in P5, where there are in fact, in fact infinitely many conics through arbitrary points. And uh, then the question will be, well, if I choose this embedding thing more carefully from the real point of view, well, can I arrange that these that this conics actually become circles? And the then in the Zegre, uh, embedding well in P1 cross P1, there are two families of lines, but these become two families of conics under the, the, the embedding. Okay, so now maybe there's another case that uh, that's reasonably well known, and I think I want to just focus here on, on this example. And uh, then, so it's a degree three surface inside P3. And then, well, you might have learned at some point that the degree 3 surface in P3 that contains 27 lines. Yeah? So now if you just take any of these lines and you run a plane through it, now, now a plane intersects this degree C surface in a degree C curve. But it contains this line, so the so degree one is already accounted for, the remainder is just a, a conic. So that means that on a degree three surface that has 27 real lines, and there are examples like that, there are in fact 27 real families of, 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 of conics. You see, this is a really huge number, and I don't have a good, good uh, picture of it or any, any picture, well, it turns out that, that you can make only six of them actually circles. So, so that there will not be a, uh, be a surface with 27 circles <coughs> through a general point. Actually. Yeah. Okay, and so then there are the, yeah, 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 yeah. if you know what the Apezzo surfaces are, this is an interesting list, uh, otherwise this is the only example. Okay, so now, now let's now try to approach this, this question. Do we have circles or do we, we have conics? And when I see for algebraic geometers, that's a, a very hard uh, this, uh, this distinction. So uh, we are used to working over the complex numbers and, and so uh, we typically don't have a metric. So, so that means the degree of a curve is a very good invariant to us, or the genus of a curve is, but whether it's a circle or an, an ellipse usually is not a question that makes sense to, to an algebraic geometer. But luckily, the, the, there is a classical theorem here that helps us. And now, 
many people are using the word classical CRM to refer to something that's fairly recent, but this is in fact a classical CRM. <laughs> so it was proved by Hipparchus, uh, something like, what is it? Uh, 2,200 years ago, nearly, okay? And then there was a modern treatment was given by, given by Halley, which says that the stereographic projection is conformal, okay? So now, and so what is a stereographic big proje projection? That if you have a sphere and you put a, put a the plane through the the equator and then you stand at the North Pole or maybe look at the South Pole if you like you look and you just look at a, at a point on the surface of the sphere and you go on till you, you hit the plane. And now what's actually quite remarkable about it that if you have a circle on the sphere then its image will be a circle in the plane. You see, if you, if you sort of just have a circle in C space, and the image is almost always an ellipse. But, but sort of that's the remarkable thing, thing is that, that here the, uh, the, the, the circle on the sphere becomes a circle on the plane, and conversely. Now, why is this very, very useful for us? Because so we are interested in some surface that's contained in RC, and I would like to understand the circle in it. Now, let's look at the inverse image of it under the stereographic projection. Well, then I have a surface inside SN, and then it still contains now circle. Now, but what's nice about circles, uh, about SN, that and the, the, the conic that's contained inside the sphere is automatically a, a circle. Why? Because the conic is contained in a plane, and if I intersect a sphere with a plane, well, then I get a lower dimensional sphere. If the dimension is right, then I get a circle. And so that means that once I'm in the sphere, then it's enough if I find conics there, because they are then automatically circles. So that, that, that means that a really natural place to look at this question is not in surfaces in just Rn, but surfaces inside Sn. Okay? And then just count the families of conics that are contained there. Okay? And so now then how do we translate this? into algebraic e, e geometry. So that means I want to understand here you know, some real algebraic surfaces that are contained e, e, in the real n-sphere that have at least two real families of, 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 of conics. Now, the, then of course, once we are here, we don't need to ask this over the reals. We can ask this over an uh, an arbitrary field. So, for instance, over the field of rational numbers, that I have an arbitrary quadric hypersurface, so it's defined by this degree two, two, two polynomials uh, in the variables x1, x1, xn plus 1. And then I would like to understand the surfaces in it that contains at least two families of, of, of conics. Well, Let's go on translating the algebra geometry because I told you that the most interesting thing cases are when, when, uh, when just P2 is just mapped by the degree 3, three 2, two polynomials somewhere. And so in general, if I have two algebraic varieties, P and X, then I can look at the space of, of maps from, 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 from P to X and since I want to, to fix the degree, it's a nice, nice invariant. Let's look at the, at the maps that are given by degree two polynomials. So, and so the, that this means that the algebraic geometry question that I have now, I fix a field 
and a quadric hypersurface. And then I would like to, to describe the, 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 the spaces, the degree two maps of P2 that land into that quadric hypersurface. So then back in my original question, if I solve it over the reals, this will, will give me the surfaces that contain a two-dimensional family of circles through, through each point. And the other is if I have P1 cross P1, and again, I want to look at the degree two maps in, into the the quadrics and these will give actually, uh, actually so the, most of the new examples of, 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 of surfaces with two one-dimensional families of circles. Okay, and so uh, th th there are a few more cases uh, where the method that uh, works, but in general it's very hard to describe, describe uh, spaces of, of, of maps like this, but in this case, a case, it will work. Now, because this completely algebraically, and maybe here again, I'm interested in, yes, I will treat the second case, case uh, more carefully. So I just, I just start with some quadratic form, and then I want to find some, some polynomials, pi, in two variables, and uh, here I'm uh, sorry, I think I wrote this inhomogeneously. So these are just degree a, a two polynomials, they are not homogeneous. And so then I just want to find solutions where the xi's are just degree two polynomials over the field. So this will then correspond to the, to the mapping of P2 into to this. this this quadric. Okay, now the, the then algebraic geometry usually the question is easiest over the complex number. So it, 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 it turns out it's the same over any, any, any algebraically the, the closed fields. So what I'm uh, what I'm especially interested in is the Veronese as the degree two maps. And now it turns out that this space a set of degree two maps from P to to a, to a smooth four-dimensional quadric turns out there's the most interesting case. Uh, that has altogether five components. Okay? Now there are uh, the, 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 there are two components uh, where the image is just the Veronese the embedding, but it turns out there are sort of two ways the Veronese can sit inside the Sign the smooth four-dimensional quadric. Then there is another there com component where the image, in fact, sits inside the four-dimensional linear uh, subspace. So this is it's very special. It's a singular uh, projection of the of the the Veronese surface, and in fact, it's a special projection. It turns out that it's singular along a line, a general projection of the of the Veronese into, into four space, we'll just have a unique singular point, but these are special projections, they are singular along a line. And uh, then there are maybe the least interesting uh, thing in cases, uh, the quadruple plane, and so the image is in fact just a, just a plane, but I have a degree four map on, on to the to some plane that's contained inside Q4. So that's that very, very interesting. Okay, now before I can, can state what happens over an arbitrary field, well, let's, uh, we need some terminology on, on quadratic form. So if I have this, this, have this four-dimensional uh, quadric, that's the find in a degree two homogeneous <coughs> polynomial in six variables, let's call this x0, x5. Now, uh, the, uh, then this has a discriminant, the discriminant of, 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 of q6. Now for us it's defined only up to, to, to squares because uh, geometrically, the, 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 if I multiply q6 by a constant, I get the same same hypersurface, so the discriminant is defined up to a, to a square. 
Now, uh, the, 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 then there's a bit reduction theorem, which, which says that if you, your quadric it has a point over your field, then you can, can split off two variables as x4 times x5, and then remain just something of three variables, and maybe you, you can repeat it a, 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 a few times. And, and so then when there are no solutions that's left, that's called the anisotropic kernel. And there is a special case that the easiest to, to deal with is a split form x0, x1 plus x2, x3 plus x4 for x5. Okay. And so now then the case that, uh, that we are interested in from the point of view of celestial surfaces, then here the quadric, well, I, I just have the equation of the sphere that has discriminant and then minus one is anisotropic kernel, it has rank four and it is non-split. Okay, so now let's see, see what the solution are. And the most interesting is to understand the Veronese, the, the com, com, components. And so sort of I told you that there are, there are two, two components. They, they both have dimension 20. They are essentially just P, P20, at least they are birational to it. But you see, sometimes they are defined over your field and sometimes they are, they are, 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 are conjugate. So it turns out they, they correspond to the values plus or minus the square root of minus the discriminant. So I told you in the sphere case, we are interested the discriminant was m minus one, so that means I get two points, I get two actual uh, com components like this. Okay, so then, then that means that there are, are sort of two ways of, 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 uh, of, of arranging that the Veronese surface it sits inside the sphere. Okay, now, uh, of course you might say that sort of the Veronese, uh, that, 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 see the quadric has a large automorphism group. So you might say that maybe we should be interested in these maps only up to the automorphism group of, of, of the quadric. And it turns out that the answer here is in fact, in fact very nice. There is a, a, a theorem. I could not find, a, find an actual reference to it in the, in the literature, but probably it was known to Scorza and Semple around 1920s. So, so it, it's included as an exercise in the book Sample of Roth from 1949, but, 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 but I think it gives no hints. A modern treatment was given by Ivan Shepard per the Baron. And it says that, well, so, that, that, so that you are interested in a four-dimensional quadric that contains a Veronese surface. Okay, well, then what you can do is you can blow up the Veronese surface and you, con you can contract them all the secant lines so these are lines that are contained in the quadric that intersect the Veronese in at least two points. And now it turns out that if you, you, you do this, then the quadric, it becomes just a, a, a P4. And uh, then the, the secant lines, they all together, they map to just a, a curve. It's a degree four rational normal curve. And so, actually, something very interesting thing is is go, go, going in on here, because so uh, beforehand, uh, what had the Veronese surface? Well, that was unique. That just P two, 
But then the quadrics, especially if, if, if you are working over some fields like the rational, there are lots of different and, and co -co 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 quadrics. And so that means we had a we had something like a fixed surface that's contained in some variable quadric. Now then on the other side of this picture, well that ambient space became just before it, it, it is really actually the Li, 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 p, p, four. And then uh, what changes? That just this rational normal curve. Now, what's a rational normal curve? So if you live over the complex number, that just you, you take the line and you map it into four space by the degree four polynomials. Now, of course, here we are maybe over an arbitrary field. So what you should think that you have a plane conic and you and you map it into four space by degree two polynomials, and so that means that up to isomorphism, these rational normal curve, they are the same as as the conic in in the plane. So that means that it's a quadratic form in just three variables. So somehow this this thing we started with a quadratic forming six variables and now in the end answer we have just a quadratic form in in three variables that tells us everything about this situation so maybe i want to go to the algebraic version of this yes oh okay so this is a, a completely algebraic version of this, this statement. You start with a, uh, with, with a six variable non-degenerate quadratic form, and you are asking whether it has solutions of the form where the x i's, they are degree two homogeneous polynomials in just two variables. And, you know, I mean, the general case is and so I have here six of them. The vector space of this degree two polynomial in three variables has dimension six. So the general case is when these are completely independent. And now then the answer is that, that you can find a solution if and only if this Q6, you can write it in this very special form. So x0, x5 plus x1 square, square and so on. And it turns out then up to the automorphisms of the quadric, there is a unique solution. And so, so here is a, oops, sorry. Yes, so the unique solution. And well, I sort of try to give you sort of the simplest solution. Maybe this is, 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 is not it. OK, then let's see. I, I think maybe I should stop here and then there is some time for questions maybe if the